I am recording the book called Moving Mountains by John Eldridge. Chapter 1, Prayer That Works June 26, 2012 was a simmering summer day in Colorado. Thermometers in Colorado Springs would report a record-breaking high of 101 degrees Fahrenheit, fueling concerns about a wildfire burning unchecked in the mountains west of town. Fire crews were spread thin, and drought conditions had prepped the hillsides like tinder. My many worried eyes were turned toward the hills that day. Then, as if on some malevolent cue, winds started gusting to 65 miles an hour. A 35 mile per hour blast will almost knock you over to give you some perspective. 65 miles per hour is considered a violent storm on the Buford wind scale. Storm winds and flames on dry mountain terrain make for an unholy trinity. The Waldo Canyon fire jumped containment lines, like the German blitzkrieg racing across Poland in 1939. It began sweeping east toward the city limits, unchecked and ravening. When all was said and done, 18,247 acres and 346 homes were consumed. I was sitting at my desk that afternoon when a colleague walked in and said, Have you seen this? My instinctive reaction was to look at the mountains, our office windows face west, and I saw the vanguard of the fire cresting the last ridge before town. We'd been following the reports hour to hour. The fire had grown to 4,000 acres and was deemed only 5% contained. My neighborhood, we border the forest, had been placed on evacuation warning twice, and for days we watched the column of smoke rising over the mountains from the fire's epicenter west of us, billowing to a height of 30,000 feet like a thunderhead or the plume of a volcano, all orange and black and foreboding. But the reports kept assuring us that the fire would move north and west and bypass town, so we went on with our lives. Until I saw the advancing flames crest the ridge, I grabbed my phone as I walked out the door and called Stacy. Pack up, I'm headed home. They haven't given the evacuation notice, she, she said. It's coming, I told her. The fire is coming. I can see it. I'm on my way. Like a man running before an incoming tide, I literally raced the fire home as it swept ridge after ridge. We grabbed the dog and a few belongings. It's true what they say, how little actually matters to you when it comes down to the moment and said goodbye to everything else. Our neighbors were the last to leave. They later told us that trees on the hill above our house were exploding, stuck in the traffic jams caused by the evacuation, ashes drifting down like snowflakes. We frantically called and texted friends asking for prayer. My 78 Land Cruiser had no air conditioning, so I soaked a scarf of Stacy's in water and held it to my mouth to prevent smoke inhalation while I made contingency plans should the fire catch up to us. The winds were howling down the mountain now, driving the flames forward like the hounds of hell. We took cover east of town with some dear friends and watched anxiously. It would be three more days of fire and smoke and shrouded hillsides till we heard the news. Our home had been spared. Bits and pieces of the story began to trickle in. But it was the reports of the fire crews that left us speechless. A veteran fire chief and a handful of wired wildfire hotshots had gathered on our street to stand in wonder as they witnessed something they had never seen before. The 100-foot wall of flame should have swept down our summer crisp hillside and engulfed our home in a matter of seconds. But it did not. Every time the advancing fury approached our property line, it wavered, hesitated, and pulled back. The raging furnace would not cross our property line. It would advance, then retreat, advance, then retreat. Though the winds were at its back and the fire had just covered miles in a matter of seconds, we realized it was at that moment, three days earlier, that a friend had texted us. I saw an angel above your house spreading its wings and flapping them against the wind and the fire. I think you are going to be okay. When we were finally allowed back into the neighborhood, we found that the low-lying grass fire had burned right up to our porch. But the major assault had not crossed our property line. The aspen trees in our yard were still in their summer glory. I know, I know, the story raises some difficulties. It touches the raw nerve of your own longing for rescue and your history of unanswered prayers. Other people were earnestly praying as the fire swept down. 
how come their homes weren't spared i don't pretend to know the answer to that like you i have my own story of prayers answered prayers unanswered and silence i can't quite make sense of this is not a story about my prayers at all what i do know is this every day when i step out my door i see up on the hill the outline of blackened tree stumps and then coming closer after you cross our property line green living trees one side looks like mordor the other eden an irrefutable witness to the power of prayer a disruptive but hopeful truth look let's go ahead and name the elephant in the room some prayers work and some prayers don't why does that surprise and irritate us some diets work but most don't no one is really surprised by that we simply keep looking for the one that will work for us some investments produce and others don't you look for the program that works for you some schools are effective while others fail badly hopefully you can find the solution that is right for your child there is a way things work can you name anything in life where this isn't so i damaged my elbow last summer doing some yard work i ignored the problem for weeks until i was forced to see my physical therapist i went under the assumption that a couple visits ought to take care of my problem after all it was just a strain it's not like i broke it or something yet therapy took months and i was so irritated by that and it was irritated at me that is i kept irritating the muscle by using my elbow before it was healed i kept aggravating it because i didn't want to accommodate my lifestyle to account for the realities of a tiny muscle in my left elbow you know the irritation i speak of something adolescent in human nature just doesn't like having to submit to the realities of the world around us and within us we want to eat whatever we feel like eating then we are surprised and dismayed when our health collapses down the road we want exercise or weight loss to come quickly and easily we want it to fit neatly into our calendar we want our friends to be good to us without ever having to look at how our personalities impact them we want our kids to turn out without making the sacrifices in our parenting styles that are required to fit their needs and so it is with prayer we just want it to be simple and easy we want it to go like this god is loving and powerful we need his help so we ask for help as best we know how the rest is up to him after all he's god he can do anything the problem is sometimes he comes through often he doesn't and we have no idea for the rhyme or reason why we lose heart and abandon prayer and we feel hurt and justified in doing so we abandon the very treasure god has given us for not losing heart for moving the mountains in front of us bringing about the changes we so desperately want to see in our world the uncomfortable truth is this that is a very naive way view of prayer on a level with believing that all a marriage needs is love or that we should base our foreign policy on belief in our fellow man the simple view of prayer has crushed many a dear soul because it ignores crucial facts there is a way things work god is powerful i ask for help and now it's up to him it reminds me from a scene from the movie patch adams patch is a young medical student with a heart of gold he wants to offer health care to the disenfranchised he rallies a group of like-minded idealists and they begin to chase their dreams then tragedy strikes patch's girlfriend is murdered by a schizophrenic man who is among the outcasts they were trying to rescue the scene then takes us to a cliff top patch is standing on the brink the mood is ominous it appears he is about to take his life patch is arguing with god i like that part very much he's reaching out he's wrestling in the right place then he reveals his misunderstanding of the world patch is looking up to heaven answer me please tell me what you're doing silence okay let's look at the logic you create man man suffers enormous amounts of pain man dies maybe you should have had just a few more brainstorming sessions prior to creation a pause you rested on the seventh day maybe you should have spent that day on compassion his understanding is incomplete dangerously incomplete it leaves out some awfully essential facts from that story you create man 
man chooses to rebel against you. We hand our lives, the earth, and the history of the human race over to the evil one. All of our misery flows from this fact. But you intervene. You sent your son to redeem us and restore us. Now we find ourselves in an epic war for the human race and the planet. Do you see what a difference those omissions make? You cannot begin to understand something like murder or wildfire without those elements of the story. Nor can you understand why some prayers work and while others don't. There are answers. Prayer sets up a terrible dilemma for us. We want to pray. It's in our nature. We desperately want to believe that God will come through for us, but then he doesn't seem to, and where does that leave us? I believe God is in the dilemma. I believe he wants us to push through to real answers, solid answers. For one thing, this reality we, we find ourselves in is far more dynamic than most folks have led to believe, especially people of faith. Like Patch, we hold dangerously incomplete understandings of our situation such as God is all-powerful. He did not intervene. So, it must be his will. It must not be his will to intervene. Yes, God is sovereign. And in his sovereignty, he created a world in which the choices of men and angels matter tremendously. He granted to us the dignity of causation, as Pascal called it. Our choices have enormous consequences. We will have much more to say about this going forward. But prayer is not as simple as, I asked, God didn't come, I guess he doesn't want to. We have embarked on the most exciting story possible, filled with danger, adventure, and wonders. There is nothing more hopeful than the thought that things can be different. We can move mountains, and we have some role in bringing that change about. Maybe we can begin to find some answers, or at least a new way of looking at things, in a short story from the Old Testament. During the reign of King Ahab, Sirah, 860 BC, the Middle East was leveled by a three and a half year drought. Crops failed, famine swept the land, herds of livestock were put down because there wasn't a wild tuft of grass to keep them alive. It was a scene right out of the 20th century American Dust Bowl, or the more recent famines in Africa. But relief was close at hand. God spoke to the prophet Elijah that the time of the drought had come to an end. After a time in the third year, the word of the Lord came to Elijah, Go and present yourself to Ahab, and I will send rain on the land. 1 Kings 18 verse 1 Finally, the heavens were going to relent. Rain was coming. A real gully washer was headed their way. A genuine biblical deluge the kind that sinks ox carts up to their axles in mud and gives the kids a week off of school. But before it could all happen, and this is the fascinating wrinkle in the story, Elijah had to pray it would rain. Now why is that? Why didn't God simply send the rain? We don't know. We have to stick with the story. Elijah climbed to the top of Carmel, bent down to the ground, and put his face between his knees. Go and look toward the sea, he told his servant, and he went and looked. There's nothing there, he said. Seven times Elijah said, go back. The seventh time the servant reported, a cloud as small as a man's hand is rising from the sea. So Elijah said, go and tell Ahab, hitch up your chariot and go down before the rain stops you. Meanwhile, the sky grew black with clouds. The wind rose, a heavy rain came on and Ahab rode off to Jezreel verse 42 to 45. I love this narrative. It is so practical and immensely helpful when it comes to understanding prayer and how it works. God is going to come through all right, but he insists on involving Elijah's prayers. It reminds me of Augustine's line, without God we cannot and without us he will not. We find ourselves in the sort of universe where prayer plays a crucial role, sometimes the deciding role. Our choices matter. Next, Elijah doesn't just take a quick whack at it. No little cut flower prayers here, as Eugene Peterson calls them. No little Jesus be with us today prayers. Elijah is determined to see results. He bows and prays and then sends his manservant to see if it's working. Is it having any effect? 
I love his posture, his willingness to give it a go, see what happens, and then adjust himself to the results. The servant comes back and reports that the sky is bleak and empty, just as it has been for years, barren as old Sarah's womb. This is a point at which most of us give up. But the old prophet sticks at it. He has another go and says, sends his man to have a second look. Nothing. So he takes his cloak off, puts his shoulder to the wheel, and gives it yet another try. He's not letting the evidence discourage him. Six more times he sticks with it. By now the rest of us would have bailed down to Starbucks to commiserate about the dark night of the soul and what to do with the silence of God. Not this old Israelite. He's still up on the mountain persevering. After eight rounds of prayer and rounds really does feel like the right word by this point, you get the feeling they are like rounds in the ring, full of sweat and grit and a real going at it. After the eighth bell, the servant says, Well, there's a puff of cloud on the horizon, not any bigger than your fist. And that's all it takes. The storm is on its way. Contrast this with a story Anne Lamont shared in her autobiographical book, Traveling Mercies. She was recounting her somewhat justified paranoia over possible melanoma. Her father died from melanoma in a six-week wait to get a biopsy done. Anne had returned home from her dermatologist and was praying. So I wrote God a note on a scrap of paper, it said. I am a little anxious. Help me remember that you are with me even now. I'm going to take my sticky fingers off the control panel until I hear from you. Then I folded up the note and put it in the drawer of the table next to my bed as if it were God's inbox. Now, I like Anne Lamont very much. I think it is a touching story, so true to our humanity. But it is just not helpful when it comes to prayer. Whose prayers do you think are more likely to see results? Elijah's or Lamont's. If you were going to ask one of the two of them to pray for someone you love, who would you choose? So let's be honest. Some prayers work and some prayers don't. We might be embarrassed to admit that, but you know it's true. If you were interested in prayer at all, you were interested in prayer that works. That kind of prayer is the focus of this book, which brings us back to Elijah the Tishbite. There is an overlooked passage late in the New Testament that is going to begin to connect some dots for us in a wild way. It comes from the book of James and he brings us back to the old man praying on the mountain. The prayer of a righteous man is powerful and effective. Elijah was a man just like us. He prayed earnestly that it would not rain and it did not rain on the land for three and a half years. Again he prayed and the heavens gave rain and the earth produced its crops. James 5:16 to 18 The brother of Jesus was giving his readers a tutorial on the subject of prayer. He had seen some serious demonstrations of prayer we might recall, growing up around the man who turned a boy's lunch into an all-you-can-eat buffet for 5,000. James pointed to the famous drought story I just cited, then made a staggering connection. You are no different than Elijah. That was his purpose in using the phrase, Elijah was a man just like us. James was trying to disarm that religious posture that so often poisons the value of biblical stories. Well, sure, that was so-and-so, in this case Elijah, and they were different than us. Nope, not the case. Actually, James makes it very clear. Elijah was a human being just like you. In other words, you can do it too. I'm not going to try and convince you that you ought to pray. If the struggles of those you love, the heartache of the world, or your own dreams, desires, and afflictions do not move you, nothing I say here would be more compelling. What I can do is put a far, far more effective understanding of prayer in your hands, together with enough applications that you begin to get a feel for how things work. There is a way things work. But first, let's lift off our hearts a few of those dangerous misunderstandings in the way we look at God and prayer. Chapter 2, Third Graders at Normandy I am among the millions who have fallen in love with the Chronicles of Narnia series. We shared them as a family when our boys were young, and we continue to love them as adults. 
The books, by the way, are much, much better than the movies. If you've only met the stories in film, you must go back and read the originals. In fact, Stacy and I are currently reading aloud book six, The Silver Chair, to each other in the evenings. I'm struck this time around by just how dangerous an adventure the children are tasked with. In chapter two, they meet Aslan on his own mountain, and Jill is told why he summoned them out of our world and into Narnia. And now hear your task. Far from here in the land of Narnia, there lives an aged king who is sad because he has no prince of his blood to be king after him. He has no heir because his only son was stolen from him many years ago, and no one in Narnia knows where that prince went or whether he's still alive. But he is. I lay on you this command, that you seek this lost prince until either you have found him or brought him back to his father's house or else died in the attempt or else gone back into your own world wait wait that second piece died in the attempt my goodness these are grave orders for a couple of ten-year-olds aslan is the best kindest most jesus-like figure you'll ever meet in literature this is the sort of story he has for them? Would you send your fifth grader off to Somalia? And yet I think author C.S. Lewis was onto something very true about the character of God and the world in which we find ourselves. The children are being called up. We see a similar theme in J.R.R. Tolkien's The Hobbit. Gandalf arranges for young Bilbo Baggins to join a company of dwarves on their quest to recover the lonely mountain and the treasure that lies buried in its halls. The young hobbit has never held a sword, never slept outdoors, never even been beyond the borders of the Shire. He loves books, tea time in his armchair, and he always carries a handkerchief. Furthermore, Gandalf does not know for certain whether or not the dragon Smog, chiefest and greatest of all calamities, is lying there in dreadful malice. Bilbo could be walking into a trap. Now remember, Gandalf loves Bilbo, loves him dearly, Yet, he is sending him on a very dangerous adventure from which he cannot promise the hobbit will ever return. Then he adds, And if you do, you will not be the same. Which brings me to the first of two assumptions essential to prayer. God is growing us all up. First John 2, 12-13 I write to you, dear children, because your sins have been forgiven on account of his name. I write to you, fathers, because you have known him who was from the beginning. I write to you, young men, because you have overcome the evil one. Children, fathers, young men, how beautiful. How kind of John to remind us we are all at different places in our spiritual journeys. We are all at different stages of maturing. Children in the faith know the basics. They know they are forgiven. The young men and women know other things. They understand the battle. Fathers and mothers are further along still. They know God intimately. We are all underway, and we are not all in the same place. This is very gracious and realistic, and quite helpful when it comes to understanding your own life or the lives of those around you. If you think about it, you can probably name the children, young men, and fathers and mothers in your life. God understands where you are. As George MacDonald assured us, what father is not pleased with the first tottering attempt of his little one to walk? And God is absolutely committed to your growing up. What father would be satisfied with anything but the manly step of the full-grown son or daughter? Elijah was probably once like Lamont. Lamont is on her way to becoming an Elijah. To this, God has committed himself most fervently. As it was for many parents before, teaching our sons to drive was a hair-raising endeavor. Merging into traffic that felt like Han Solo pushing the Millennium Falcon into light speed, sudden braking that seemed equally certain to send me through the windshield. They were giving it a go. It was terrifying, and I was so proud of them. I was delighted with their efforts, but of course I would be more than disappointed if their driving was the same now ten years later. So it is with God. He is utterly delighted with our attempts at prayer. He loves our little prayers tucked into drawers. And he is calling us upward to grow into the maturity we were destined for, including mature prayers. Elijah was not tucking little prayers under rocks on the mountain. I doubt very much if it would have rained if he had. 
But here is the problem. Most of us don't quite share God's fervent passion for our maturity. Really now, if you stopped 10 people at random on their way out of church next Sunday and polled them, I doubt very much that you would find one in 10 who said, Oh, my first and greatest commitment this afternoon is to mature. Like Bilbo, our natural investments lie in other things. Lunch, a nap, the game, our general comfort, including getting others to cooperate with our agendas. Yet there is no mistaking the theme in scripture. God is committed to growing us up. Ephesians 4.13 Until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature. Colossians 4 verse 12 Wrestling in prayer for you that you may stand firm in all the will of God, mature and fully assured. 1 Corinthians 14.20 Brothers, stop thinking like children. Hebrews 6 1 to 2. Therefore, let us leave the elementary teachings about Christ and go on to maturity, not laying again the foundation of repentance from acts that lead to death and of faith in God, instruction about baptisms, the laying on of hands, the resurrection of the dead, and eternal judgment. Wait! Knowing how to heal the sick by the laying on of hands is considered first grade level stuff? I think I missed that class. But the call to grow up is very clear. And how does God provide for us growing up? What are his means? Situations that stretch us, strain us, push us beyond what we thought we could endure. Those very same circumstances that cause us to pray. This assumption is important for one simple reason. It changes your expectations. When you show up at the gym, you are not surprised or irritated that the trainer pushes you into a drenching sweat. It's what you came for. But you'd be furious if your housemate expected this of you when you flop home on the couch after a long day's work. Perhaps you might begin to see the connection in some of your feelings toward God. Bilbo, Jill, and Eustace are being called up. And suddenly they find themselves in dangerous parts of the world facing threats they never dreamed of. Which brings me to the second assumption critical to effective prayer, a core assumption the scripture holds about your life. We are at war. News reports in the fall of 2014 about the execution of children by ISIS guerrillas left us all speechless. We received a number of desperate emails crying out for prayer. Islamic extremists were going through villages in Iraq, executing men, women, and children. Christian families were among those targeted. Surely you read the reports. A family would be dragged from their home into the street. If the parents did not renounce Jesus Christ, their children were executed before their eyes. It was and remains horrible. Those reports lingered in my mind as I reread an often overlooked portion of the Christmas story. Matthew two sixteen to 18 Herod was furious when he learned that the wise men had outwitted him. He sent soldiers to kill all the boys in and around Bethlehem who were two years old and under because the wise men had told him the star first appeared to them about two years earlier. Herod's brutal action fulfilled the prophecy of Jeremiah. A cry of anguish is heard in Ramah. Weeping and mourning unrestrained, Rachel weeps for her children refusing to be comforted for they are dead. The parallel is so stark, I want to ask for a moment of silence. I have never seen this part of the story portrayed in any Christmas pageant or manger scene. For many of us raised in middle America, this genocide was completely left out of our Christmas understanding. Our visions of the nativity were shaped by classic Christmas cards, by the lovely creche displays in parks, on church lawns, and on many coffee tables. And while I still love those tableaus very much, I'm convinced they are an almost total rewrite of the story. On the night before the massacre of the innocents, another urgent moment took place, Matthew twelve thirteen to 15 After the wise men were gone, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. Get up and flee to Egypt with the child and his mother, the angel said. Stay there until I tell you to return, because Herod is going to try to kill the child. 
That night Joseph left for Egypt with the child and Mary his mother, and they stayed there until Herod's death. This too seems right out of the devastation in the Middle East, refugees fleeing for their lives, taking cover in a foreign country. But nor have I seen this portrayed in the lovely imagery surrounding Christmas time, not at least in the 20th century, not in hometown American culture. I understand that imagery is dear to many of us, but it is profoundly deceiving. It creates all sorts of warm feelings, associations, and expectations, many quite subconscious, of what the nature of the Christian life is going to be like for us. The omissions are in fact dangerous, the equivalent of ignoring the movements of ISIS. The adolescent part of me says, wait a minute, God is almighty, omnipotent, ruler of a hundred billion galaxies. His power makes a nuclear meltdown a mere sneeze. His son and their plan to rescue the world was in imminent danger. Why didn't God Almighty send his angel armies to protect young Jesus? Indeed, why did an angel have to come in the middle of the night and whisk the holy family away in secrecy, hiding them south of the border? Herod and his secret police were nothing compared to the living God. The story ought to make you wonder about your assumptions of what exactly is going on here and how God works in the world. Certainly it ought to cause us to rethink our views on prayer. I asked he didn't move. Seems grossly out of touch in light of these stories. Perhaps this account of prayer from the life of Daniel will help. It begins with prayer and confusion. In the third year of Cyrus, king of Persia, a revelation was given to Daniel, who was then called Belshazzar. Its message was true, and it concerned a great war, Daniel 10.1. Daniel is troubled, as any of us would be. Why am I being given a vision about a great war? I wasn't looking for this. What can it mean? So he devotes himself to prayer and fasting for three weeks. That detail alone sets Daniel apart from most of us. The longest I have fasted is three days, and it almost took me out. On the 21st day of his vigil, Daniel is walking along the banks of the Tigris River in the ancient kingdom of Babylon. I like that. I like to walk as I pray. Suddenly, a real live angel of God appears. We know he is real and very much alive because his presence is so overwhelming the men with Daniel are filled with terror and run for their lives. Daniel doesn't run. He can't even move. He's lying on his face, nearly in a trance. Don't you love the gripping detail of these stories? A hand touched me and set me trembling on my hands and knees. He said, Daniel, you who are highly esteemed, consider carefully the words I am about to speak to you and stand up, for I have now been sent to you. And when he said this to me, I stood up trembling. Then he continued, Do not be afraid, Daniel, since the first day that you set your mind to gain understanding and to humble yourself before God, your words were heard, and I have come in response to them. But the prince of the Persian kingdom resisted me twenty-one days. Then Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me because I was detained there with the prince of Persia. Now I have come to explain to you what will happen to your people in the in the future, for the vision concerns a time yet to come. Daniel 10, verses 10 to 14. Did you follow that? God answered Daniel's prayers the first day he prayed. He even sent an angel to personally bring his reply, but the answer was delayed for three weeks because a mighty fallen angel, a demon with the rank of a principality, held the Persian kingdom where Daniel lived under his rule and barred the way. God's angel had to fight his way in, and at the end of their encounter, he told Daniel he was going to have to fight his way back out. The scriptures are sort of a wake-up call to the human race, a trumpet blast, to use Francis Thompson's phrase, from this hid battlements of eternity. 
One alarm they repeatedly sound is that we are caught up in the midst of a collision of kingdoms, kingdom of God advancing with force against the kingdom of darkness, which for the moment holds most of the world in its clutches. Is this your understanding of the world you find yourself in? Does this shape the way you pray, the way you interpret unanswered prayer? Now, yes, Jesus has come, and that has changed everything. But maybe not like you think. The advent of Jesus at Christmas time accelerated the collision of kingdoms into global war. A great and wondrous sign appeared in heaven. A woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and a crown of twelve stars on her head. She was pregnant and cried out in pain as she was about to give birth. Then another sign appeared in heaven, an enormous red dragon with seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns on his head. His tail swept a third of the stars out of the sky and flung them to earth. The dragon stood in front of the woman who was about to give birth so that he might devour her child the moment it was born. She gave birth to a son, a male child, who will rule all the nations with an iron scepter. And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought back. But he was not strong enough, and they lost their place in heaven. The great dragon was hurled down, the ancient serpent called the devil or Satan, who leads the world astray. He was hurled to the earth and his angels with him. Then I heard a loud voice in heaven say, Now have come the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ. For the accuser of our brothers, who accuses them before our God day and night, has been hurled down. They overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. They did not love their lives so much as to shrink from death. Therefore rejoice, you heavens, and you who dwell in them. But woe to the earth and the sea, because the devil has gone down to you. He is filled with fury, because he knows that his time is short. Then the dragon was enraged at the woman and went off to make war against the rest of her offspring, those who obey God's commandments and hold to the testimony of Jesus. Revelations 12, 1-5, 7-12, and 17. Look, you may not like the story you find yourself in, but your displeasure doesn't make it go away. If the execution of children by ISIS extremists doesn't clarify matter, matters, I just don't know how much more evidence is going. it is going to take to convince the church that we are at war. The dragon has declared war on all those who align themselves with Jesus. The moment we were born, we found ourselves in the midst of a fierce battle. If this doesn't shape your understanding of the role of prayer, you will find yourself repeatedly disappointed and disheartened. For one thing, prayer is not simply asking God to do stuff. Clearly, knowing this, can you begin to see why sweet little Jesus be with us prayers are so grossly inadequate to our situation? Why Patch Adam's understanding of the world is so utterly incomplete and heartbreaking? When Aslan lays his charge upon the children he loves, he is doing them a great honor. He knows what this will require. As did Jesus when he said to his dear ones, I am sending you out like sheep among wolves. Matthew 10.16 The metaphor so perfectly describes her situation we almost want to smile. Like when the young bride and groom are waving goodbye and the grandfather leans over to the grandmother and whispers, They have no idea what they've just gotten themselves into. The humor of absurd understatement. But sheep among wolves is at the same time so foreboding, we decide not to think about it. Maybe he was just referring to the early disciples. To sum up, we are trying to clear away mistaken assumptions about God and his world so that we can better understand prayer. God is growing us all up. We find ourselves in the midst of a great and terrible war. Now, if I were him, I think I would have taken care of the first so we could get on with the second. 
Let's get everyone whole and strong and filled with the power of God, and then we can take Normandy, spiritually speaking. Or, I'd prefer even the reverse, overthrow the kingdom of darkness, rid the world of the evil one in one foul swoop, and then there will be breathing room to see humanity restored. Because honestly, to conduct the invasion while God is still growing us up looks to me like hitting the beach at Normandy, not with a battalion of Marines, but with Mrs. Simpson's third grade class, the junior high youth group from First Presbyterian, and a handful of ad adults chosen at random from the phone book. It looks like a hobbit with a handkerchief going to slay a dragon. But I did not write this story, and the one who did hasn't consulted me on the matter. So this is where we are, in precisely the same position Bilbo and the children of Narnia found themselves. Perhaps that's why we love those stories. Something deep inside knows it to be true. Now, if you believed both assumptions, if they were woven into your deepest convictions about the world, you would want to learn to pray like a soldier wants to learn to use his weapon, like a smoke jumper wants to learn survival skills. We really have no idea what sort of breakthrough is actually possible until we learn to pray. Perhaps we too will be ending droughts and stopping wildfires.